You're listening to the Complete Human Podcast, hosted by co-founders Jana Breslin and Evan DeMarco. We share authentic conversations about wellness, longevity, personal growth, and bio-optimization, along with inspiring stories that encourage community and social responsibility. We hope you enjoy this episode. In 1818, the world was introduced to the Frankenstein monster. Frankenstein's creation was assembled from old body parts and strange chemicals and animated by a spark. Mary Shelley's monster has taken on numerous incarnations through the years, spawning comics, TV shows, and a never-ending supply of movies. The story of a scientist who creates a horrible monster using electricity has largely been thought of as a cautionary tale. But perhaps Mary Shelley was ahead of her time in understanding the role electricity plays in keeping the human body healthy. We've come a long way since 1818 in our understanding of how the human body uses energy. But how has that knowledge helped us shape practical tools to improve overall health? The answer is PEMF, or Pulsed Electromagnetic Fields. Welcome back to another edition of the Complete Human Podcast with your hosts, Janet Breslin and Evan DeMarco. Today, we take a fascinating look at the world of PEMF with Denise Kornick and Dr. Joshua Berka. Denise holds the Guinness World Record for the fastest human on a bike at 184 miles per hour. And Dr. Burke is a medical consultant at Beamer, one of the leaders in the PEMF market. Stay tuned for this one. It's electrifying. I used to hate mornings. I'm not a morning person and I always found myself struggling to get out of bed. Once I did, I would need some serious coffee to get me going. That's all changed now that I have added Beamer PEMF to my morning routine. Eight minutes of meditation with the B-pad, a cup of coffee in my supplements, a walk for my dog Mayday, and I'm ready to tackle the day. I've heard of PEMF or pulse electromagnetic frequency for years. After all the research, I decided it was time to get one and I'm so happy I did. The Beamer unit with its B pad for total body support and the B spot for targeted aches and pains has increased my energy, made my workouts better and decreased my recovery time. Well, I think what we'd like to do is just start off with an introduction of who you are, you know, what kind of got you into this work. Um, You talked about the Institute of Functional Medicine and Uh, I've been playing in that world for a very long time. Uh, You know, Jeff Bland is a good friend of mine. And uh, so, you know, but uh, we want to hear a little bit about your background, what got you here, and then really want to have an in-depth conversation on this technology, what it is, what it isn't, you know, what people can expect. You know, how have we gone from the days of, uh, you know, Mary Shelley Frankenstein of, you know, reanimating corpses with electricity to this (laughs) understanding that there is a a real health benefit to these, uh, you know, pulse electromagnetic frequencies. For sure. Uh, We run in the same circles. I've been friends with Jeff for 15 years. And um, I'm one of the reasons that him and I brought even in the energy module into IFM. There wasn't an energy module. And so we went through, um, first of all, when we delivered this to doctors, it was well received and not well received. And so the manner in which I speak to medical professionals about this type of stuff, electricity, light, and electromagnetic fields, is through functionality and outcomes that occur through mitochondrial bioenergetics. So how the mitochondria is processing energy. And we look at bioenergetics, it's a very simple definition. How we take in energy, transform process, and use it to do work. It's that simple, out here or in here. And uh, there's many different physical modalities that support that process. Like I said, from electricity to light to sound, and uh, of course, PMF is what we're speaking about today. Cool. So it's not myself. Uh, my name is Dr. Joshua Burka. I am trained um, double board certified as naturopathic physician, naturopathic doctor, as well as Chinese medicine, acupuncturist. So I studied both Eastern and Western medicine. And uh, so I'm into functional medicine, integrative medicine, and more so than anything, patient-centered medicine. Um, we look at so many times we think of medicine as disease care. Uh, and so I really look at a holistic perspective uh, through a healthcare model that facilitates choices, decisions, and lifestyle. So I would really look at myself as rather than saying, oh, I'm a doctor or teacher, which I do, I'm also a facilitator of that process for each unique individual. I've become, um, I guess, an expert in uh, this field because, well, quite simply, I got bored with biochemistry. And that's where Dr. Bland and I connected is crossing the line between biochemistry and biophysics. It's a very important distinction because you can't tease them apart. They're interrelated with each other. And I literally had to leave the country. I couldn't, uh, there wasn't good training here. I had to go to Germany, Sweden, uh, and train with some experts throughout the world uh, to get to this place of understanding how these biophysical interventions 
uh, have a physiological effect, both positive and negative, with um, the human system as well as other organisms, biological organisms. So that's uh, my background in a nutshell. Cool. Wonderful. Well, let's. So, thank you for that. Um, and I and I love what you said about you know being a facilitator, right? Because I, I think right now we're seeing this convergence of Eastern and Western medicine, and you know how to how do practitioners actually become you know advocates for their patients' health and wellness rather than you know here's a prescription, go away. I have to see twenty five patients today. Uh, you know, otherwise, you know, my HMO or PPO is going to pitch a tent in my you know where. <laughs> um, so, uh, again, I want to say thank you for that. But let's transition a little bit into the topic that we want to discuss today, which is PEMF, and really give us, you know, I, I'd like to say give us the layman's view of what the heck this stuff is. So yeah, I mean, pulsed electromagnetic fields, let's throw out the P and just talk about EMF. Electromagnetic fields that include electricity and magnetism. And as you run electricity, let's just say, I mean, I have a wire here, and this, I literally do have a wire here, <laughs> as, I take this wire, for example, as I take this wire and I move electricity through it, the electrons flow and that's electricity, but around it, it actually creates a field. It's called the right-hand rule. And as the finger goes this way, that field is moving in that direction. And so you can change the polarity or you can change the direction, which changes the field itself and the flux density or the intensity of that field. And so there's so many things involved with for instance, pulse electromagnetic fields that affects uh, general health and wellness, all pulse electromagnetic fields are, they deliver an activation energy. Energy can't be created, it can't be destroyed. It can only be transformed. And so when we look at pulse electromagnetic fields, we have to look at appropriate and precisely, de uh, precisely define what's known as field energetics. Field energetics, um, they're directly related to parameters such as frequencies such as pulse shape, waveform, amplitude, uh, intensity or flux density of the field, and spatial orientation. So it gets complicated. It, it's kind of like, well, tell me a little bit about, about the, the pie. Well, there's a lot of ingredients in that pie. It's not just, wow, it tastes great. So these parameters are not just important, but they're really crucial to achieving the uh, positive physiological effects that supports our general health, our wellness, and even specific for diseases. Um, but when these field energetics are defined and it's packaged in the appropriate manner and deployed, it's then and only then that we see users of pulse electromagnetic field therapy that they're going to experience these optimal results. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I have a question about um, EMFs. I think a lot of people have a negative association with EMFs, and this is very different. Um, but, you know, people think about microwaves, cell phones, stuff like that. How, how is this different? So, and this is the thing, that there's tons of EMFs when we look at electromagnetic fields. Let's start with the fundamental basic electromagnetic field, one that we've evolved with for eons, millennia, and that's the geomagnetic field. I mean, I mean, just sitting where you are, you said you're up north in California, here I am south. Let's, talk, let's think about this. Can you see, I mean, I have an earth spinning up here uh, in the corner. Our earth is spinning at about 10,000 miles in around, around its axis. In that process, it's moving about 62,000 miles an hour around the sun. Having a molten core, that generates a huge field that extends from the center all the way past the surface or the crust out to what we call the ionosphere. And actually, electromagnetic fields, in, they, they're infinitesimal. They go forever, but they decrease exponentially based on the distance unless they interact with charged particles or a charged particle. Consider yourself as one filled with those. Aurora Borealis. The reason the Aurora Borealis occurs is between the interaction of our ionosphere, this geomagnetic field, and energy coming in from the sun. And that excites these particles. I said energy can't be created or destroyed. So it ignites them to express themselves and light the sky up, whether it's hydrogens, heliums, or other type of ions. The same activation energies occur in the body with PMF, all the way down to, to like water dipoles, for instance. So when you look at EMFs, uh, especially uh, electromagnetic fields, they have negative connotations because the research that comes out talks about EMFs, low frequency, high frequency. It would be like me saying, you know what, Evan, Jenna, all pills are bad. Well, I know there's pills that can kill you, but this one happens to be good for you. And so that's how we have to look at it. It has to do with information. And uh, for instance, not just information within the field or the signal, information that us as people may or may not be being told, but facts, truth, 
or um, maybe just limiting that information. For instance, I have a phone here. Flip this phone open. I go into the settings of this phone. I go into my general. And I just jump down for just the kicks of it into legal and regulatory. Then I go into RF exposure. Let me be clear. You'll never see a video, you'll never see a marketing of an individual doing this with a cell phone, ever. You'll see dancing with uh, earbuds on, you'll see them holding. It says right here to never put that within five millimeters of your body. Why? <laughs> because it's already been proven. Yeah, yeah, check it out. I mean, that happens to be iPhone, but, but it's all true. It comes down to what's called SAR, or um, standard absorption uh, rates. And so different energy absorbs at different frequencies and different intensities. That kind of stuff has been shown unequivocally to have detrimental effects on mitochondrial bioenergetics, mitochondrial function. Look at this through studies up to the Nordics, North Nor uh, Norway, Finland, Sweden. Even in California, about five years ago, when I came back here, I was in Abu Dhabi in the Middle East doing some work. Um, there was a big push to put standard absorption ratings, just like calories. The lobbyists pushed this down and said, no, no, we don't need to do it as long as it's within safety thresholds. So the real simple question or answer rather to this is it comes down to a lot of ingredients. And one of the most important is the safety thresholds of power or flux density. So is this high frequency, low frequency, as well as the shape of it? I'm speaking a language to you. I don't need to yell. I can speak very gently. But if I start speaking in a way that's offensive to you, you're going to put up a block, whether it be energetically, uh, physically, just in your face, it doesn't matter. The same thing is true for the human body. We just have to be able to know when we're being exposed to these type of adverse fields based on our feelings. And unfortunately, most people aren't connected with their body in such a way. Um, but there are very sensitive individuals. And we are literally bathed in a soup of electromagnetic energy, uh, not just from Wi-Fi, cell phones, radio frequencies all over. All you have to do is tune in, 98.7. You get to listen to what that information. And so we can tune frequencies to have various effects on the human body, both detrimentally and positively. And this is unique because EMFs are not, they're not toxins, they're not pathogens, they're not smells. It's not something that's invasively in your face. So, you know, oh, I need to avoid touching that. This is a totally. Chemical. You know, this is an invisible toxin i guess we could call it for you know sure. this, but very interesting so i i remember uh reading a long time ago about like i believe it's called carillion photography carillion yep yeah, yep yeah. so that would show you know your electromagnetic fields and we call those auras i, I think yeah. uh, but but is that the same thing i mean are we really talking about this you know uh, color spectrum of electromagnetic frequency that's visible through a very specific uh, photography style Really what, great question, because when we look at the electromagnetic spectrum, Evan, it's, it's wide. I mean, you have dangerous stuff that's really tightly uh, bound or, or, or fields that are tight, tightly, uh, we'll say, packets of, and we have to understand this first. There's waveforms and there's molecules. And you can't tease those apart either, because at any one point, a molecule has a wave and a wave is a molecule. I actually kind of coined this term wavicle. And that's and, really the tenets of quantum mechanics, right? That's quantum sometimes mechanics. it's a wave, sometimes it's a particle. That's exactly correct. And when we look at PMF from this perspective, we can't just look at one versus the other because they have relationships. For instance, light is within the electromagnetic spectrum, but there's visible light, non-visible light. Speaking about light, you have little plants or but we'll say bacteria that live in your body. We don't call them bacteria, we call them organelles, but by all means, mitochondria are not part of your body. They're actually separate DNA, the whole works. We protect them. They serve us by giving energy. And so these mitochondria, as well as other chromophores embedded throughout the body, absorb photons and kick out energy, full circle. Energy can't be created or destroyed. It can only be transformed. So when it absorbs this energy, it then kicks out the energy that it needs to to support function. Um, yeah, there's a very specific range of health benefits, light is within there as well. And radio waves we have found because the earth is emanating these geomagnetic waves or energy waves. When you start getting into gamma waves or microwaves, yeah, that's damaging. It heats up the tissue. It, it creates ca carcinogenesis, cancer in situations, um, all the way down to subclinical 
um, adverse effects such as fogginess, digestive problems, autoimmune, so many things related to misinformation or bad information being absorbed by the body, whether people are aware of it or not. The next question you'd ask is how do we protect ourselves then if this is so bad? That, that would have been the next question, <laughs> yes. Yeah, and the answer to this is not something you're gonna wear around your rad neck or something you're gonna wear on your head like a pyramid because so you are a body. Your foil hat. <laughs> yeah, your foil hat, there you go. <laughs> Or something on your phone, I've seen these little discs. I, I mean, I've been working with Johnson Space Center and NASA as a consultant through Beamer for, for many years. These things don't exist. They use these to cover the, the capsule so it blocks electromagnetic radiation. But if I had that on my phone, my phone wouldn't even work. The best protection is knowledge, number one. Number two is you're not going to block yourself from all this electromagnetic energy, so you better be able to be resilient and adapt and overcome. And if you can't, you're outside that spectrum. And this is a tough conversation to have with a lot of people because they're like, oh, if I can't survive, are you saying genetic? Yeah, I'm talking about the functionality of survival of the fittest. And are we going to change these things? This isn't ripping a Ferrari turn. This is a tractor trailer turn right now. And we will make changes because they are finding detrimental effects. But we are going to have negative um, sequelae from these fields that are, and we already see this, but they are not directly. Um, causally related, they're more correlately related as it relates to science. And I'm not going to get into the politics around that, but there's also politics around physical medicine versus chemical medicine, like pharmaceuticals versus, uh, we'll say, electroceuticals. I don't know. I, I hope that answered your question a bit. It did. Uh, and, and I think that really teed up something that we're hearing a lot about. And I'd like to, before we kind of pivot into how, you know, Beamer and PEMF can really help, you know, modulate some of the, you know, some of these more detrimental frequencies. But one of the things we hear about all the time is 5G is going to kill us all. So, you know, obviously, from my understanding, I'd love to get your scientific view on this, is, is that going from 4G to 5G, it's kind of like the Richter scale, right? It's not linear, it's exponential. So this 5G network, you know, has a ton of output of radiation harmful um, on a spectrum that, that's not good. You know, is that accurate or are we, is this a conspiracy theory or are we actually cooking ourselves? 5G in general is called millimeter wave technology. Um, who hasn't flown and stood up in millimeter wave technology and looks through your clothes? It bounces and absorbs into superficial water on your skin. These are, these are microwave radiation. Back to power and dosage. Some people will do better with the dosage. This can be turned down or turned up. My pixels of my camera, the higher I go, the clearer images I get. What's 5G for? 5G for is to expedite the transfer of information amongst people or uh, infrastructure and um, potentially involved with a tracking process or identification of a visualization for artificial intelligence mapped with other biometric parameters that are either being collected by choice or not by choice. I have a choice. For instance, I'm wearing a ring that's giving information. I feel confident that that company is protecting my information as soon as that changes, I will eliminate that. But when we're looking at 5G, sure that's going to exponentially accentuate the ability to do work at what cost? And not to just humans, because hell, we are resilient. But what about the entire micro ecosystem from bees to birds to everything that involves our relations? And so when I look at that, it's not just the air we breathe in, it's, it's really how we integrate or interrelate with our society, what we see, taste, smell, feel, experience, and more so how we interpret and process that inf information, which leads to perception. And uh, yeah, am I a fan of it? I'm a fan of innovation. I'm a fan of technology with safety and efficacy information that's done. And I'm sorry, but this is not scientifically researched at this time. And so this rollout is something that I'm not for until there's more scientific evidence. Makes sense. We, we love hearing that, right? I mean, part of the complete human platform is, is obviously giving people uh, the greatest tools, which in, in one of those is information to you know, improve their health and wellness journey. And we talk a lot about health span versus lifespan. 
And, you know, it, it was funny. I think when we first started on this journey and looking at bio-optimization, as we want to call it, we started to throw out some random arbitrary numbers. And, you know, we look at like David Sinclair's work and some of the, you know, the stuff that we've seen. It's like, well, the human life expectancy has the potential to exponentially increase, right? Like at one point, someone said that the first person to live to be a thousand years old has already been born. And so, but then, but then the question is, is, well, what kind of health is that? You know, if I live to be 150, but I, you know, I've got a colostomy bag and I can't, you know, uh, I can't do anything for a while. Um, is that really health? So we want to talk a little bit about like mitochondrial function, mitochondrial optimization, and how does PEMF really play into that? How do we optimize our human performance? And that's where it stops usually, but I wouldn't stop there. I would say performance, recovery, regeneration. Mm -hmm. Because that thousand year old is not going to have a colostomy bag. Because as it stands right now, I can go build an organ from your DNA. And in space, as of last week, they came public. And not only, I don't even need a scaffolding, a physical structure for this anymore. I can use electromagnetic fields to create a grid to grow an ear, for example, or to grow, coll to grow collagen tissue that can be utilized for regenerative capacities. Wow. And so regeneration is absolutely involved directly in the body, utilizing very specific information tools, light, sound, electromagnetic energy. So is, is, that the, is that the modern day version of that movie, The Island, where we kind of grow these uh, you know, clones in a, in a far off space, and then when we need to, we harvest organs for, for specific uses? Or do we get into using PEMF to really look at um, mitochondrial biogenesis and keeping our own power plants going you know, century after century or decade after decade, long before the average life expectancy as it exists now? You know, sure, sure. As and, and I say both. So... Before we go into mitochondrial bioenergetics, I want to talk a little bit about differentiation of mitochondrial biogenesis versus, versus mitochondrial bioenergetics. Biogenesis is the replication, the growth of mitochondria, and we can trigger mitochondrial biogenesis mainly through tr low-grade trauma, stress. Because so if I choke them out and I don't give enough carbon dioxide or uh, oxygen, exercising, it's hypoxia then you're making these mitochondria grow so they can make more energy and use less oxygen. And so this is a, a beautiful format that's um, designed by nature that we can optimize through biohack or through a life hack to help support. So mitochondrial bioenergetics is how that mitochondria takes in energy, or rather takes in information, processes it to create ATP, adenosine triphosphate, the usable form of energy of our body. That's our currency that we can use. So. Beamer, for example, I won't say all, all pulse electromagnetic fields stimulate the body through called induction. This cell phone induces a current. I put it here. That is also inducing a low-grade current. Now, that's okay. And the early um, adopters of pulse electromagnetic fields thought it was all about power. How can I put in information and stimulate an inductive effect, move charges? And so you need a lot of power for that. That thing you had on your shoulder that was creating acumen potentials, that's power. They don't care about the information. It's about transferring energy to grow. And so it transfers energy into the tissue, mitochondria, and you have a direct effect. But Beamer, for example, actually uh, is the only example. They all support low-grade in, uh, increase of circulation. But Beamer actually targets the microcirculatory system to change the manner in which the microvessels, and to be specific, pre-capillary arterioles, both small caliber and large, are oscillating how they're moving, it's called vasomotion, how the vessel moves. And as the vessel moves, the fluid moves, which is called flow motion. And that vasomotion and flow motion is integrally integral to functional blood flow, which is maintained and regulated by the neurovascular interaction and not your brain alone. I was taught in med school, my brain, the nervous system, central nervous system controlled our vessels. Game's over. Nitric oxide locally can be released and override your brain saying, we need to close this down. And your system said, no, we need oxygen. We're opening up. So there's a unique interrelationship, which is controlled by something called the autonomic nervous system. This is the self-regulatory system. And this is one of the most mysterious, intriguing, and hottest topics in all of physiological medicine right now, how blood flows and where it goes. And I don't associate blood flow with blood flow alone anymore in my life after studying Chinese medicine. 
And after certainly reading one of the oldest quotes that I look at, probably three, 4,000 years old in the Huangdi Neijing, the Yellow Emperor's Classic of Internal Medicine, it says this, blood is the mother of qi or energy, and qi or energy is the commander of blood. This yin-yang relationship of the qi control it, not controlling, but regulating it, but the blood being the structure. It's this wavicle, energy matter, energy matter. One can't exist without the other. And how we take in information, breathe, is how we flow. It's a direct correlation how your blood flows and how you flow. You can measure this through heart rate variability. You can measure this with performance. Who is that top performing athlete? It's not just because they're genetically or they practice so much. It's because they know how to access a very special place called the zone. And that zone is a balance between parasympathetic and sympathetic, rest and digest parasympathetic, sympathetic, fight or flight. And they know how to be in that middle and be completely present. And when you're in that presence, there's some very specific things that occur. One in particularly, time begins to bend. Literally, time will start to change and you'll appear that you're moving faster or things are moving slower. It's not really, it's your perception. You're in a space, which is actually not a space at all, of that, uh, we'll say, level of performance. Well, it's funny that you bring that up because Denise, uh, you know, uh, was talking about who we just interviewed before you was talking about, you know, being in that flow state, you know, biking 180 plus miles an hour behind a car. And, and you know, you think about that. I, I think we've all had those experiences, especially as athletes, where, you know, you're in that zone and it's just like, yeah, it, it's time almost becomes something you can manipulate. Um, so it, it's fascinating that as we really talk about PEMF, which is, you know, electro or EMF, if we want to talk about electromagnetic sure. frequencies and fields, um, you know, something that, you know, I don't want to say it's esoteric, but it has a really kind of, you know, non-Western medicine approach to, you know, how the body works, but there's something so integral to that and how we perceive our health, I, I think is just normal people. And it's like, if you're an athlete and you know, like, hey, I'm in the zone, you know, that's where you're supposed to be. I mean, that's the goal of all athletes. And I think, For you sure. know, whether it's the runner's high or things like that, you know, we all have these simple things that get us to where we know we're supposed to be and we're doing the exact same thing. And, and so let's, let's talk a little bit about how Beamer does that. And, yeah. you know, actually what I do want to bring up is, uh, so we were reading this book, which is PEMF, the fifth element of health. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to it. into this. So one of the interesting things that they talk about are like the six coil and I guess the 80,000 windings of, of, you know, the, the coils and that one. Um, obviously, the Beamer system is quite a bit different than that. So let's talk a little bit about the structure of that versus what we've come to believe. Sure, sure. So let, let's start with this because we, we talked about the, the, uh, the whole, the, all of the ingredients. So we have to start at some fundamental ingredients. Forget about the deplorable. I mean, this is a handset. There's thousands of them. I can make it my own. You can make it your own. So let's talk about the information that the, the, the uh, handset first. The handset, or well, let's say speaker. There's something called fidelity. How clean something sounds. You can have a good speaker or a bad speaker, and the coils are like speakers in this way. And you can have lots of wrappings. You, you ultimately want high fidelity. Beamer uses a. Huh, Beamer, Beamer uses one of the highest fidelity materials. We do something called, we use Litz coils, our, our Litz wire, where it's actually interwoven within each other for our larger type of coils that we're working with. And again, what you see in a, in a Beamer um, applicator, for example, are different. I mean, these are harder coils than this one versus circular coils. The most important aspect is, one, are you putting in, so electricity going in, what's going in versus go, going out? Is it efficient? Is it highly efficient? Beamer, for example, is 100% efficient in its delivery of electricity into field. And you would almost look at it as a picture. I'm looking at a monitor versus HD versus non-HD. Yeah, you're getting information, but it's not crisp and clean. It would be like my voice being a little, uh, like uh, you could still get me, <laughs> but it would be a little uh, muffled. And so that's what we look at. And then you have to look at coil placement. Are these coils so large that they're overlapping? No, the coil placement. Beamer actually has um, multiple patents, and one of their patents is, I mean, waveform, um, time variation, as well as the coil placements within the body. So they are the delivery is important, but the most important part is the information. So that comes down to the waveform. 
And you'll, you'll hear a lot of folks saying, oh, it doesn't matter if you use a, a square wave or a trapezoid or that book, the NASA wave. Let me be really clear. The square wave is one of the oldest waves going. NASA doesn't use it anymore. They used it 20 years ago. That's why they're working with Beamer. That's why we've had a Space Act agreement for the last five years, five, six years almost, because the waveform really does matter. The language matters. And now, not just the language, how's the staccato or the delivery of that language? We call these timely variations or spatial orientation. Now, do those spatial uh, orientations change over time? These are time variations. So think of information coming from a pulsed electromagnetic field device as almost like a song, a specific rate and rhythm that specific tissues in your body already know the dance to. Hmm. In Beamer's specific situation, the patented rhythm, not just the waveform, of triggering or facilitating the resuscitation of vasomotor function, which full circle goes back to bringing more oxygen, more blood flow, establishing an increase of mitochondrial bioenergetics. Therefore, it enhances both cellular performance, tissue performance, as well as organism performance as a whole. Life moves pretty fast, and we're all struggling to catch up sometimes. Between work, being a single parent homeschooling my daughter during the age of COVID, and trying my best to stay healthy, there simply isn't enough time in the day to get it all done. I needed something to help with energy levels. At 41 years old, I noticed I wasn't recovering as fast as I used to, especially after a training injury. I needed something to help me optimize my life. Just eight minutes in the morning and eight more in the evening have made such a big difference in my energy levels and my workouts. My performance is better, my recovery is quicker, and I just feel better. I'm also less stressed, which helps me be a better father. Eight minutes on the bee pad an hour before I go to bed and I'm out. Let's be honest, there are a lot of gimmicks out there, but PEMF is one of the most studied and validated therapies available, and Beamer is the leader in the PEMF world. Check out Beamer in the link below. I promise you won't regret it. Um, I got a little out on the side. I don't know if that covered the full question, but... Um... No, totally did. That, no, that was fantastic. And I think one of the other things that we, we read in this book, and you know, we've got a couple different ones here, the body electric, you know, electromagnet... Totally, that's where I started. Of life. You know, trying to understand, and, and I think that what you just did there was really explain uh, in layman's terms what this all means, right? Because it's, you know, we've heard EMFs are bad. Um, I, I remember watching that ridiculously horrible movie, The Core, uh, you know, where the Earth's core stops spinning. But, you know, it's kind of fascinating where we learned a little bit about how, you know, the electromagnetic field protects us from cosmic radiation and especially working with NASA. So we, we assume that you guys are really trying to modulate and optimize, you know, what, e or what uh, cosmic radiation is doing to... Uh, uh, to astronauts. I remember, um, I think it was Elon Musk who said that one of the biggest challenges in getting people to Mars wasn't the, you know, wasn't the fuel, wasn't the technology. It was the cosmic radiation cooking the astronauts by the time that they got there. So, you know, understanding how all of these work. Um, but I, I do want to kind of come back to the initial part of that question is what sets that apart from what we commercially see in places like Amazon with these totally. amethyst yeah. crystal masks totally. that they're saying are PEMF? Before we go there, I do want to, I mean, it's important just because an applicator, like a PMF applicator, looks like a full body mat, or this looks like an entire thing like this. For instance, this has only three coils in it. That full body mat has six coils, for example, at certain key placements. So that's, again, the thing. The, the full body stimulation system, it, it really depends on the actual coil geometry. That's the rate limiting step of the direct inductive effect or inductive stimulation. Now let's talk about these crystal mats or amethyst filled mats. I talked about the aurora borealis where you excite this in the atmosphere. Energy can't be created or destroyed, only transformed. When I put electricity into a specific uh, form of a uh, crystal, it excites that crystal and it spits out its direct energy signature. You can measure these things. Amethyst has one, uh, these crystals, that crystal, they're all specific based on what they are because they're made of molecules. And so, these particular devices have electricity that go into them and they emit a low grade field, but it's not a pulsed field. They're complete, they're apples to oranges. And I mean, apples to nuts, like really different. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? Like to, 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 totally different. One, you're exciting. And the only, pot, pot, the same thing is you're transferring energy to the body, but how it's being done is very different. So if I lay on an amethyst crystal mat, for example, I'm going to feel warm, relaxed, Ions are going to be transferred. I love that feeling. It feels great. But you can't compare them because when you look at Beamer, for example, or other low frequency, low intensity pulse electromagnetic field systems, they're delivering information 
that's, and this is the important word, resonating with specific tissue structures. And all the way down to the molecule, we can talk about biological oscillators. And you're not going to find so many folks that are going to be able to talk about this because the time that it takes to go from research into medicine can be up to 18, 20 years. Um, I don't sit and wait for a double-blind placebo-controlled trial with 200,000 people in it to know that I'm serving my patients. I look for safety. Number one, do no harm. Number two, do I see efficacy that's not hurting or damaging a patient? Absolutely. I've, so, I've um, been involved with submitting information to help with research because of clinical intervention. We're on the front lines as clinician exploring these types of things. And again, I'm not doing this alone. I'm a contractor, a consultant for Beamer. We do something called post-market surveillance and we look at the effects, efficacy, adverse reaction. I've looked at thousands, and I mean thousands of Beamer users, both adverse effects, which are very few, if used properly. And that's the beautiful thing about PMF or even the MSIT. It's very hard to create adverse effects unless you don't control one of the most important parameters, folks, and that's dosage. Mm. So yeah, the, you can't really compare the two. Both have efficacy, they're efficacious in their own right, but different stories. So that brings up a really interesting question is, you know, if you really look at clinical outcomes of the use of Beamer outside of, you know, the, uh, the sensory properties, or I guess the perception of the patient, what are things that you could actually test for that you would know you'd had a, a positive outcome before and after? Tons of biometrics, sleep wake cycles, heart rate variability. Um, when I'm going brass tacks and I'm talking to Dr. Bland, for example, I don't play around with anything outside of real objective analysis. Beamer, for example, and I'll say this right to you, is the most researched pulsed electromagnetic field device on the planet. And when I say that, I'm not saying that we have the most uh, studies, 500, 600, although we do have studies up 650, 670 people, 670 people. We've looked at so many different things from genetics from stem cells, from osteodegeneration, from cancer, carcinogenesis, from pain. We've looked at all types of aspects of the field. And so what do I measure? I measure blood flow. You might talk to somebody uh, who has another low frequency, low intensity device, and they'll say, well, my device enhances blood flow like yours. No, it doesn't. And I promise you it doesn't. And the reason is because I can put a heater and increase blood flow and I take the heater away, let's just say a hot towel, my blood flow goes back. I haven't changed other than that initial response. Once I remove the stimulus, my body goes back to physiological norm. Beamer's inputting information that is actually retraining the system of the body, almost like a feedback mechanism. And because of its frequencies of 10 ranges of 10, not through 30 and 30 hertz, and how it's pulsed changes the vasomotor rhythm or oscillatory rhythm of the microvessels, which full circle enhances mitochondrial bioenergetics by delivering more oxygen and clearing out waste products. So, so would, you see an, would you see an improvement in like aortic pulse wave velocity over an extended period of time then? Uh, that's a possibility, not off the front. You're gonna really look at macro, micro circulation versus macro, although we are one of the first companies with, I won't say alone, working with the agency, NASA, Johnson Space Center, where we are looking at utilizing high fields, meaning thick coils, Hemholt style, uh, big ones, versus small and affecting macro versus microcirculation. And so there's a difference. All vessels aren't the same, meaning the idea that the heart pumps blood through the body is preposterous. And I mean this, if you really understand it. The heart serves as a central relay or facilitator of this process. It, does, it, it can't pump all the blood through your body. It just you, you, you wouldn't do it. You have micro pumps, micro little hearts all over trillions of them all over your body through the endothelial cells, which regulate and control micro oscillations, which control perfusion. I mean, for instance, you talked about athletics. If, if I'm riding, um, and Denise, and I'm holding on and it's at 180 miles an hour, you better hope my blood flow is in my shoulders, my arms, my upper body, not in my digestive tract. So the cool thing about your body when it's working functionally is it can direct perfusion, it can direct blood flow where the metabolic action is needed. But where it doesn't do this is when we start to become dysfunctional at an autonomic level. When does this happen? When do you know it? You don't know it. There's no doctor out there that's going to tell you, oh, you have a dysfunctional low-grade subclinical autonomic nervous system, which is infecting your blood flow microvascularly. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. I haven't seen that diagnosis out there yet. 
Of course, but I can look into your eyes with technology out of Europe right now in Canada, and I can look at microvascular flow parameters. I can look under your tongue up in space, up in the top of Mount Everest, for example, and look at the uh, factors there. Jeff Bland was one of the first people that got me going on this. And he said, when I get into an airplane and you go up into an airplane, you begin dying immediately. Why do you know that? Because your heart rate goes up and your blood pressure starts to drop. It's stressful. How long can you manage maintaining that regularity in a stressful environment that comes down to resilience? And so leaving the geomagnetic field of the earth, it's not so much about protecting from ionic spheres in space. It is. But that can be done through various resins, and, and it's, it's being done, for sure, just to let you know. The key factor, unfortunately, Mr. Musk, I have to disagree slightly with you, is actually tricking the body to think it's on Earth. Hmm. And what that means is you have to, and not the body alone, more importantly, your microbiome, which is smarter than your cells. They're more related to mitochondrial relationships and communication through mitochondrial DNA, communicating with bacterial DNA versus our own nuclear DNA running the show. I'll tell you today, our mitochondria and microbiome are absolutely in charge of running our bodies, and our nuclear DNA is just an interface to this process. Which, that, that really brings up the topic of epigenetics and how yes, things like Beamer can impact, you know, a positive health outcomes over the genetic hand that we've been dealt. Totally. Yeah. So we talked about an activation energy. Um, Beamer's focus is on the microvascular system, but I will tell you there is research happening right now at federal agency level, DOD level agency. And right here, I'm down near La Jolla and UCSD, San Fernando, all these places down here, Salk Center. This is, the, there's certain confidential things that are occurring, certain things that are secret level clearance. Let me put it to you this way. <laughs> You can take a single cell and grow it into certain tissues by delivering it the song that it knows to do. So I could grow cartilage from a stem cell by putting information into it or creating an environment that it can grow in. That environment could be sound, light, electromagnetic energy. And this really comes back from an epigenetics perspective all the way. I mean, here we are during these times. And for those of you out there, I'm sure you know what these times mean. Mm, put it this way. You can turn things on. You can program viruses. You can program cells with low grade. And I'm talking pico currents, whispers of information. You don't need power or flux that you were moving your arm with that big PMF. You can program information into the body through super small packets of information. And this is being done, will continue to be done and you will literally be able to grow organs that I said in the beginning of this that, that are specific to you. And uh, that's occurring as we speak. We, we talked about crystals. You are a liquid crystalline uh, hydraulic matrix with fluid dynamics using water in many of its phases, including liquid and a meso phase of a gelatinous substance. You brought up space. Well, the space in between tissue isn't just filled with air out here. In the body, it's filled with fluid. And that fluid is very unique, depending whether it's in the extracellular matrix, whether it's intracellular, extracellular, their surface tension, their quantum mechanics. It, it serves as a interface between energy and matter in our body and is directly involved with ionic charges through the meridian system, as well as functional blood flow through plasma and blood combinations, as well as superficial electrical flow over endothelial cells of all of these microvessels. What was this? It was like a Chinese study with like you yell at water or you yell at plants and they either, it, 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 it reminds me of this. And we've talked about this. Yeah, Dr. Emoto. Right. Yeah. The so when I was hanging out up in Portland, I went to medical school up in Portland, Oregon. I was uh, hanging out for a bit with Dr. Emoto before he passed. Um, this was back years in 04, 05. I asked this man, what, I mean, you've done all this work and if you can give me one piece of information as a clinician and a doctor, what would it be? And he didn't hesitate. There were people all around and he looked right at me, engaged, and he said, listen to good music. And he just smiled. And I, and I just looked at him and we knew that I knew it's, it's not just music. It's being around music. So there's a quote that I say uh, uh, that's from Lao Tzu. That's about like, watch your, 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 your thoughts. They become your actions. Watch your actions. They become your character. Watch your character. It comes your destiny, that type of thing. The information that you thinketh immediately emits from your brain into a thought field, which expands infinitesimally. So this ability to vibe with people, and first of all, your brain is dwarfed as it relates to the electrical and magnetic field 
uh, as it relates to the heart. And, and there's great work through do, uh, Roland, Dr. McCready through the HeartMath Institute, for example, very close to you folks, uh, on these field energetics and communication. So yeah, even thinking can influence fluid and water around you because it actually does in your brain and in your body. So in his mind, you know, real fast, tell me again, we are a crystalline aqueous. What was the, what was your uh, analogy? I don't, um, I just, I just realized. Was- oh, li- oh, li- oh, liquid crystalline matrix. And again, some of these uh, thought things, uh, these things I'm talking about are referenced from other folks and I never take things as my own. I also never tell you what's, if I'm talking to you, it's going to be fact unless I preface it with my hypotheses. So I was just thinking that about it, yeah. in fact, uh, Dr. Maywan Ho. Uh, please look at her information. She speaks about liquid crystalline matrices, as well as Dr. Pollock up north in Washington. We've been working with him for years with Beamer, uh, looking at fluid dynamics, uh, looking at changes in water flow, looking at changes in blood flow. And so, yes, you can influence these things with light, sound, and pulse electromagnetic energy. That's cool. And then I also realized, like, if you walk up to a random stranger, that might be the best pickup line of all time, is you're just a liquid crystalline matrix. <laughs> Well, a liquid crystalline matrix has to be able to absorb like an antenna. So let's just put it this way. We're antennas. No one can, there's not a single person that could could deny that. You have micro antennas even on the membranes of your cells. So Qigong, have you ever heard of Qigong? Oh yeah. Qigong is very simple, the cultivation of energy. It involves very simple concepts, intention, body position, and how you're breathing, how you're bringing information, light, life, prana, whatever you want to call it, chi, in and out of your body. And how you do this has everything to do with how you're receiving information and emitting information. These are also facts. And one of the interesting things that we read in this book, too, is, is that, uh, you know, they measured uh, practitioners of Qigong, and they were able to ascertain that, you know, the uh, there are, you know, zero to 30 hertz, which is what we see kind of in the, in the Beamer coils, uh, you totally. know, was the stuff that was coming out of their hands. So we know that, you know, it, it, this is... It's funny because when we say some of these things, it sounds out there, but it's some of the most concrete science that I think that we have going back as long as, as people have been really trying to extend their health and wellness uh, you know, lifespan or, or health span. Um, it's all fascinating. I, I kind of want to come back a little bit to the, to the Beamer, um, you know, the whole platform, right? Because again, you guys have really restructured this, you know, the, the, the mats, the, um, the whole interface device. So what was the catalyst for doing that versus kind of the traditional six coil? And, and what can we really expect to see with that versus the large map? Totally. Okay. So let's start with some real concrete stuff. And I'll even give you a taste of some of the stuff I personally have been working on that's not published, but observable and is being used to submit to expand Beamer's presence uh, within the United States and globe. So in general, there are classifications of devices, first of all. And those classifications, class one registration, two, uh, class two, class, uh, class three, class four. You can bring a device, uh, for instance, an electromagnetic field device into the United States by registering it, but it has to be within certain thresholds that it doesn't push it into the upper level. I'm going to say this today. Every single electromagnetic field, pulse electromagnetic field in the pulse in the class one category is misclassified. Hmm. Okay. This is a big, big deal. And I'm not going to go into the details on this. This is confirmed through FDA and Beamer move Beamer is the first one through the gate of the class two. One, it's limiting because you have to prove everything you're going to say. But number two, it shows efficacy efficaciousness and safety. If that book, for example, that promotes a particular device um, which runs circadian rhythms, biological clocks, they have a lot of bells and whistles. Here's what my ask would be. Show me a legitimate study that identifies not just safety, but efficacy of that particular product and that combination for its use, not hypotheses. I love the organ clock. I do Chinese medicine. I know all about it. It's beautiful. But there's not a single individual or company that has been able to concretely dose the beamer or or dose a a device at a given time based on an organ system failure. And when that comes out, I want to see it because it will be actually a class four medical device, not a class one. So classification or 510k clearances are directly relevant as it relates to, is this considered both safe and effective or just safe? And then class two moves up into being able to make claims like pain, 
uh, being able to use it for, I mean, there's a long history with PMF. I mean, everything from pain, inflammation, wound healing, some of the modern ones are transcranial ma- or repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, which uses high pulse powers for fibromyalgia, headaches, even some terms, forms of cancer. So there's different aspects. And I want to put it to you this way. To have the inductive effect, you have to be in contact or not in contact, but in relationship to the geometry of the coil with target tissue. Now, if I held this, for instance, and I ran it up my arm and I ran a test either on, I use, so a testing directly would be blood flow. How do I do that? Laser Doppler, gold standard. I even have some stuff I'm looking at now, which is, I don't have to touch the body. And this isn't curly and photography. I'm talking about the ability to bounce photons off the body to measure the amounts of blood flow that are moving. You can do this through pulse oximetry. Um, there's various aspects with Doppler. When you put your finger into like this, There's a little laser that's going in here that's sensing how much blood's moving through my finger all the time. It's a simple process. It's called Doppler measurements. So I'm able to look at true real-time microcirculatory changes, both locally under the geometry of the coil. And this is something I'm going to say that I haven't seen with any other PMF devices. I'm going to now put a sensor over here. Not touching. Somehow, and this is only that I've observed on a microvascular level, somehow the neurovascular system, and I have labeled this as neurovascular recruitment, which we can't really use because that's involved with cellular regeneration or rather angiogenesis. Somehow the nervous system starts dancing to the same rhythm around the body, even with a direct field interaction. This would be shocking for many people out there, and they might even turn this webinar or a podcast off because it's so disturbing. You can't deny... (laughs) what is observed. And so I would ask any researchers out there that have the capacity to use laser Doppler, to use um, spatial frequency. Uh, I'm not gonna get into the name of that because it's a new stuff and, it, and it's, I'm gonna leave it out there, but it's a higher level way of looking <laughs> at this. It's already given, if, if I said SF, it's, I already kind of gave it away, but. I feel like the CIA is gonna come knocking on my door <laughs> at a certain point here. I don't work for them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So the fact is that you can get systemic effects beyond the ge- geometry of the coils, but the FDA only allows you to talk about direct stimulation under the geometry of the coils. So there's a difference in classifications based on one safety and two efficacy. And some of, many of those are, that are in class one, I'm just going to let you know it's unfortunate, but with this uh, thing that's been going on, the FDA has been on high alert. They are very aware of this within the last eight months, and they're actually doing something about it. So if you're out there in the class one category, um, if you haven't been contacted yet, I would start doing good manufacturing practices as well as serious research to demonstrate every single thing that you're talking about. And that's the thing. If a company has a a device, and we're saying that we do microcirculation because I've done 135 patients, and another company says, yeah, we're PMF, we do the same. It's pseudoscience is the word. I'm going to repeat it. Pseudoscience. It's something that you say looks like this. I would say, oh, yeah, I have a car, too. You're driving an Aston Martin, and I'm kicking around, and I'm not going to say anything negative about any car, but, you know, something that doesn't perform like one. And I'm like, yo, I can do it, too. Yeah, there you go. You go. You might get to the same destination, but not in the same manner. Gotcha. So it's it's very important to differentiate those things. Right. Is there anyone who should not use PEMF? People that have extreme sensitivities to electromagnetic fields should not be additionally exposed to pulse electromagnetic field technology, okay? And how would someone know that? There's no tests for this. They they become the litmus paper themselves. And unfortunately, many of these people are discounted and they are said that it's in their head. The fact is they are antennas that are gathering information. We have a bell curve. And this bell curve has access on both sides. You have non-reactors and extreme reactors, and then the folks in the middle. This is the same thing with any dosage of medication, vaccine, electromagnetic energy. You have a dose-dependent window. And some of those doses, individuals need lower doses versus higher doses. I know people that were, like, if they were on that machine you were talking about, that high-intensity one, they'd be shut down for days. So it's really different. And so who wouldn't? Well, there's also contraindications, warnings, precautions with Beamer. 
because of its ability to stimulate the, uh, it's called intracellular adhesion molecule one, ICAM one, the, the immune system directly um, by the role action. It's not making more white blood cells like leukemia, lymphoma type of stuff. It's actually stimulating the action and mobility or action of these white blood cells. It's like looking out on the streets and seeing cops all over the street. It does this because there's a hormetic effect that's occurring. So when you look at it from that perspective, that's a specific result. So Beamer has a contraindication that says, if you have an organ or tissue transplant and you're on immunosuppressive medication, you don't use our product. Mm. That's it. Also, and here's one, for instance, with Beamer that shouldn't be there, but it is because of the classification. Deep VT, deep venous thrombosis. I've treated hundreds of patients with DVT with Beamer. But as of recent, the FDA said we have to put that as a contraindication because we're under a category called NGX, which is a muscle stimulator. Okay, pulse electromagnetic fields really don't have a place in the upper classifications unless you're high frequency, high intensity, you're heating tissue. But if you're actually just delivering vibratory medicine to the body, there's no classification. And so Beamer, for example, is in an NGX category, which they ultimately stand alone as an electromagnetic device. They're all TENS units, electrical stimulation through um, point A to point B, conductive stimulation versus inductive stimulation. And so in that case, you wouldn't want to put electricity over a blood clot, but electromagnetic fields, especially ones that break up, that move blood, it's almost an indication. So there are positives and negatives from being in the class two category. But one thing I can say is that the FDA wants this uh, more regulated because of the absence of knowledge of how, what is the dosage? Who's going to direct you to use it? I tell people, I can't, I'm not your doctor. I can't tell you how to use this. Your doctor has to. Well, my doctor doesn't know anything about it. And here we go until this gets up into the mainstream, which is insurance reimbursement, um, and indication-based treatments, which is happening with Beamer, for example. We're paving the way for this. And when you're doing that, then you can start integrating mainstream medicine with CAM, complementary alternative or complementary and alternative medicine. So, so that brings up a really interesting thing. We know that the adoption for standard of care within the traditional medical platform is about 17 years, yeah. So, um, which is scary, right? Because the, the rate at which technological innovation, and we talk a lot about what Beamer's doing and, and just the transition from the large mats to the platform that you guys are using. So how does, you know, how does someone listening to this and saying, okay, you know, these are things that I'm really interested in, right? We've got, you know, we've got inflammation resolution, we've got pain management, we've got all the things that we know that BEMF does, and they need to talk to their doctor about it. How does that whole process work? Do you, do you guys have a, you know, a, a practitioner portal where a doctor can call up and be like, hey, I've got people asking for this. How the hell do I integrate this into my practice? As far as I know, Beamer is the only company that has a physician on staff that is, that's me. And I wouldn't say on staff because I don't work for Beamer. I'm a consultant for Beamer for many years. I've been working with them. As I said, I've also served as a consultant for IFM. For As a doctor, I, I'm a teacher. And so I, I, whether it's one-on-one or me in front of 2,000 people, it doesn't matter. Facilitating that process of education. And so in doing that, uh, we have to help our doctors. This is how we break this 18-year cycle or 17-year cycle is we inform. We inform and we deploy therapies that are considered safe. And you do this by looking at research history. And so those doctors, many of them are very open to allowing their patients to do this, as long as it's not interfering with their medications, their devices. For instance, another contraindication might be uh, someone who has an implantable uh, electromagnetic device or electrical device, the defibrillator, uh, pacemaker, even an insulin pump, morphine pump, deep brain stimulator. You don't want to be using an electromagnetic field device simultaneously using those unless it's proven that the application of that field is within the threshold of operation of that implantable device. These are not. You would never want to put this within six inches of a, a pacemaker, for example. It could reset it. These things go up to six, 700 microtesla. Beamer and these other low ones generally only go up to about 150 microtesla. The Earth's geomagnetic field is sitting uh, varying around 45, 50 microtesla range. So we already are bathed in a field of about 45 microtesla. Active ranges that we use are from 3.5 microtesla all the way up to around 150 average maximum average flux density. And that's directly only related to Beamer that I'm speaking about as a um, medical device. Cool. Yeah. So let, let's strip away the standard of care. Let's strip away, you know, the, the integration, you know, uh, issues that we have with some of these new innovative technologies, especially with PEMF and Beamer. What 
if you know if you could if you could look at you know the next ten years and recognize you know what is the potential of this, what does Beamer do for the average person who's really looking to optimize their health in a way that you know that we haven't seen it I think in the, in the u s in the last fifty to twenty you know fifty to hundred years I don't want to talk about Beamer first, and the reason okay. I don't is because I don't want anyone to think that they need to depend on any person, place, or thing to be in good health, all right? We that appreciate that. Thank un- you for saying that, yeah. That, un- that, that creates an unhealthy relationship with substance or things or whatever that might be. And so that autonomic regulation is innately inside of each of us. You should use tools to help your body remember what that balance is. That being said, Beamer is very unique in this way because, sure, all these other devices are putting fields in. They're stimulating performance, uh, cellular performance, detoxification, recovery in this way. But I don't know of a single device other than Beamer that's targeting a specific staccato rate and rhythm to ultimately reprogram or resuscitate the functionality of vasomotor function. And vasomotor function is very unique. If you look at, like, my arm, for example, and, he, and here's the capillaries here. It's a capillary network, small caliber, pre-capillary arterial, large caliber. These are involved with squeezing and moving at a specific pattern of a dance that allows blood to not laminally throw through, but pulse through. And that pulsing through is incredibly important because as the blood moves, it needs to stop, throw off oxygen, pick up carbon dioxide. It can't just be flying by. And so there's a very specific manner in which those vessels are facilitating the interrelationship between the antennas, the surfaces of the cells, and the materials that they're taking in for survival and optimal function. So How does age that, disrupt that optimal function? In general, I would say that b- using Beamer can help support autonomic regulation, which can change the trajectory of the aging process. And I'm not talking about going the other way. I'm just talking about changing the trajectory because the only thing that really can change the trajectory is how we age, how we rust, how we burn, and how we recover from that. It's not that we don't perform as we get older, Evan. It's that we're not recovering. We don't regenerate like we used to. And so think of these electromagnetic fields, not just supporting performance, but the regeneration and recovery of tissue and how to maintain that. Beamer's a very unique thing because I said, when you pull that coil away, it doesn't stop. I have measured and measurements have been made from Beamer up to 18 hours after the application because of its unique effect on the autonomic regulatory system. So for instance, you being an athletic type of person, you might have an effect where you use the Beamer and it lasts for for days. Someone else who has multiple comorbidities, so 50, 60 years old, uh, diabetes, poor, sad diet, standard American diet, nonsense diet, sleeps bad, maybe their application of eight minutes will last two hours, maybe. It's like a massage or, you know, I lay down, I adjust you, boom, 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 your body's straight. You walk out of my office, boom, 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 you're out. You're back (laughs) out. It depends on how you're interacting and interrelating with that world of how long a therapy intervention lasts, the dosage needed to maintain, and the frequency, not the frequency 10 and 30 hertz, the amount of usage throughout a day. Uh, In general, dosage is controlled. uh, Chronic disease, I don't use high powers. I use low powers and more often. So acute injuries or acute situation, I use higher powers, but less often. And so there's a rhyme or reason to this. And there's not a well-established pattern or protocols that are out there. And that's why this is so esoteric. And many medical doctors and healthcare practitioners are literally afraid of using it because one, they don't know how to, they were never trained with this in medical school and their openness to it is limited by their, really their ability to uh, be humble and do some research because all the data and research is out there. It's not some airy fairy stuff anymore. So that, that that actually does bring up a really interesting question. Can you overdose on this? Yes, absolutely. You can overdose on anything. And so the effect, and we call this a therapeutic window. What's the minimal dose? And this is from naturopathic medicine. What's my minimal dose to deliver to you to facilitate an optimal response without causing an adverse reaction, i.e. do no harm. So that's where dose therapy, and the therapeutic dose of Beamer, for example, I know is very wide. I mean, you've got literally zero, 3.5 microtesla all the way up to 150 microtesla. So you have a lot of options to deliver that information to the body, but most people overdose because they think more is better. It's a classic thing, especially here in the United States. And 
more isn't necessarily better. I, you wouldn't take a pain med. Say my shoulder was hurting and I took a pain medication and I'm like, oh, still hurts. Let me get another. No way. I'll overdose because you have to give the body a chance to respond to the medical intervention that you're giving. The same thing is true with beamer or pulse electromagnetic field. Put information in, allow for it to respond. If you're not doing this, you're actually creating a negative experience with that information and you can actually create a resistance against that type of therapy. So that, well, okay, so that, that uh, so how would someone know then, right? Because th th that's the question is, how would someone really know that, you know, they were spacing out their interventions at an appropriate time so that they weren't overdosing? So I, I think, got, you know, use opioid addiction as a perfect example, right? Like we know you go. what yep. that can do, but with something like this, how, you know, how does someone with, like a generally healthy person without comorbidity uh, problems know that like I should be doing this every day, twice a day, something along those lines. Well, for instance, with Beamer, we give general guidelines, not specific protocols. Specific protocols are designed to be given by a licensed healthcare provider. Anyone who's giving information about the application or use of any medical or any product whatsoever for the mitigation, treatment, or prevention of a disease or condition is practicing medicine. And if you don't have a license to do that, you're practicing medicine without a license. Therefore, your protocols should be directed by your clinician. And if your clinician doesn't know, then you have to follow guidelines and see what works best for you. Why do I know this? Because I've been using this stuff for 15 years. I actually don't even, like, for instance, lasers, I don't even care which company it is. You just got to give me what wavelength is it, how much power, and I control my dosage by, i.e., the amount of joules delivered to that target tissue. Beamer's different because the ingredients fluctuate. So how do they know? Well, unfortunately, they feel symptoms. What are symptoms of overdosing? <laughs> Fatigue, myalgia, headaches, uh, skin rashes, itchiness, um, heart palpitations, increased pain. With neuropathy, for example, I most often, it's the easiest to overdose. When you have nerve pain and you're using the Beamer, if you go too fast, too quick, it's going to wake your nerves up. And especially if you've been suppressing the... Uh, expression of inflammation with a medication like NSAIDs or corticosteroids, Beamer doesn't actually cut off inflammation. It actually resolves inflammation by accelerating the inflammatory process. A totally different outlook than, oh, you have pain, let's block it. Block what? Block your perception of it or the transmission of it. There's no true therapy or treatment for pain. Cure, I'm talking about. So the, the way to get through pain is to actually heal through that inflammatory process and move into the regenerative phase of healing. How important is it to start at one and then go to 10? Um, depends who you are. It really depends who you are, Yana. And the reason why is um, I might be able to just jump and start at 10, but you have someone with fibromyalgia, Lyme's disease, um, regional complex or complex regional pain, whatever it is, and they start on five, it's over. They'll never go back because it triggers so much pain. As you... Think about this. If you're not used to exercising and I say, let's shoot out and go for a mile run, you, you're going to be in big trouble. But if we start with just wake up and go walk around the block, it's easy going. And that's how we build our resilience, our resistance. And uh, so that's why it's not a good idea to just start on high volumes. Even if um, electricity, I don't just put it on high. If I put a TENS unit on, I start low and I turn it up slow into the threshold of operation that I'm comfortable with. Not him or her, not him. I am. And so that's why we can't have cookie cutter approaches for any therapeutic intervention and more importantly than any of our pulse electromagnetic fields until dose regulations are established, which they're not. And it's almost challenging to tell, right? Because you don't necessarily feel it. Um, so it's kind of hard to, to say, oh, is this the right dosage for me? My first experience ever with a PEMF was a mat and it was a pretty large device. And um, they turned it on and I had certain muscles being like stimulated. It was very, so in my first experience with PMF, it was very much a physical, I could feel it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so that must have been more powerful. For instance, some of the stuff we're doing with pseudo Hemholtz coils, as you increase the intensity, you can literally feel it because what it does, it stimulates the nerve, inductively stimulates the nerve. So it almost feels like a dull sensation. Um, if you took two strong magnets and put them between your hand between, you'd feel like a pressure. And that's exactly what's happening is it's stimulating um, almost an action potential in the nerve. 
I'm not interested in doing that I, unless I'm trying to like regenerate a muscle that's atrophied. For an individual, most individuals, I'm interested in, in starting low and going slow. I kind of coined that term as it relates to, or that kind of adage as it relates to um, PMF, because we have to increase our dose individually for ourselves based on our experience, our exposures. Uh, that's what personalized medicine is. And uh, we really have to really think about how we can personalize a general application for us. And it comes down to your guidelines, following guidelines, following directions, but also using your own intuition and your own interrelationship of how you feel with that device. I have a lot of um, users of Beamer that lay on it, especially on the females, and they literally say, what is this? I'm like, what do you feel? She's like, I don't feel anything. I almost remember something. Like, like I, I feel in balance again. Or someone has, uh, I've had people tell me, it feels like I've meditated. I can get to a same state, HRV meditation with Beamer in eight minutes as it takes me 28 to 30 minutes on my own. So there are tools that it can use to help uh, support physiological, natural physiological processes. I remember, so when I first tried the Beamer, I went into the meditation right afterwards and I Ooh. felt very balanced in, in many ways. And I, I, I definitely noticed a, a difference there. Totally. I mean, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. And then, and then another interesting thing last night, I used it like kind of late around like 10 30 at night. And I realized that my, my heart rate was up a little bit. I had a, almost trouble sleeping because my heart. Totally. Rate was up. So I wonder if that was maybe I pushed the limit too hard. Don't use it at night. I mean, Beamer has an actual sleep program that's on two hours when you fall asleep on two hours before you wake up and it shuts down the, middle of the night. I can't use that speed program during certain times of month. I mean, that sounds weird coming from me, but what I'm saying <laughs> is the, the, the lunar cycle has a lot to do with the influence of the geomagnetic field and our interrelationship with it. So, I mean, it was too overstimulating. I could feel my heart. I was seeing kaleidoscopes. Don't use the Beamer at that time, maybe two hours before bed. Okay. Um, again, that, uh, he might be able to. No, it was, it was funny. I had, I had a very similar response, and it was um, – you know, and, and I don't sleep well anyway. So it was, you know, I, I kind of laid down and I was, I was amped up, but it was interesting. Like I, I didn't feel like I had a cup of coffee. I felt like my mind was, uh, you know, and so it, it's, it's a fascinating practice, right? I mean, just laying on this using the, you know, uh, using the B spot, you know, target, uh, targeting pieces. It's, you know, I had, I had the most excruciating back pain like two or three days ago. And, and we got this two days ago and I'm like, I feel, I feel world's better just two days on this thing. So it's like, yeah, what are you using? Been, what's that? Which what, what applicator and program? Uh, so As the pad. So what the pad, and then we started with just the program one. Beautiful, and that's exactly what you do when you work up the program two. I have this thing all over my back once or twice a day on a program three. You can see I'm sitting now. I spend ninety percent of my day actually standing. It's a rise and fall desk. Sitting is the new smoking. It's the most detrimental thing of our modern era, and it's killing people. It's truly killing people, um, not directly, but in the long term. And, and so think about using Beamer as internal exercise for the vessels versus external. And so you wouldn't use this because you wouldn't exercise through, uh, before night either. Also drinking alcohol, not a good thing with Beamer. You'll get drunker faster. So <laughs> we're going to edit that part out. Cause I think yeah. oh, your, your, your college kid, uh, you know, uh, sales program just went through the roof. <laughs> All right. Let me help you with this. So Beamer has an also be by affecting the microvasculature has a very unique manner in which it can enhance the bioavailability of nutraceuticals, pharmaceuticals, IV, whatever it might be by supporting functional blood flow. So it enhances the bioavailability delivery and then clearance of waste products, metabolic waste products. So I, I'll put it that way. No, and that, that makes a lot of sense. So then when we really talk about cellular autophagy, this becomes kind of a paramount. Let's briefly talk about senescence and autophagy, for, exa for example, because what actually kills a cell? It's called cellular apoptosis, mm -hmm. self-destruction. What's carcinogenesis? Carcinogenesis cancer, the exact opposite of that. When I'm treating my cancer patients, my goal isn't kill, kill, kill only, or rarely. It's actually to enhance the mitochondrial function or support mitochondrial bioenergetics in such a way that it can apoptose that dysfunctional cell. And so my way of treating, it, I don't even say treating cancer, I treat people with cancer, not cancer. Oncologists do that. Interesting. Yeah. So I, I feel like, it sounds like you have to go, but I feel like we've just scratched the surface of <laughs> all to talk about this. So, um, you know, if you're okay with it, we'd love to have you back on to just, you know, get even further into this. I think that this is, 
it's the funny thing is it's not an emerging field. I mean, from the dawn of time, we've understood the interrelationship between you know electromagnetism, electromagnetism. What? Yeah, you, you know what I was trying to say. I've had too much coffee or not enough, and 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 health. But now we're getting into this place where technology and our ability to monitor and, and measure that technology is caught up to what we know we can do to to you know really extend people's health spans. So I think that being said, I've got a thousand other questions. But I have more to questions go. too. Yeah, but yeah, this has been. Over. Yeah, let, let's reload. And, and, and what I'd really like to explore, we can talk about this as a medical field as well. But I, I want people, the, the only way that they're going to learn this is not by learning science. They have to, the way we learn is we reference things we already know. This is how we move through time space. And so we have to start with, with nature. What is the rhythms of nature? How did like, how are we integrated with those? And, and I'd love to talk with you about that because that absence of integrating with nature is, is actually the fall of humanity. Um, and, and you can look at this. It's not just me saying this. Look at you. You mentioned Chinese medicine. Look at the Huangdi Neijing, the Yellow Emperor's classic of internal medicine. In the first chapter, Su Wen, it says this. It talks about longevity. It talks about how people live. And it said, talking about eating vegetables. Waking at waking and sleeping at the normal hours of the day, avoiding alcohol, avoiding fatty foods. They actually said grains, uh, too much grains. They said these people who are rich and who are eating these types of food, they express disease and die thereafter soon. So they talk about exercise, movement, breathing uh, through qigong and eating vegetables and eating foods that support our system. And they have lifestyle interventions that they just made part of their daily existence. We've forgotten the way, and it's so important that we remember. When I look at Beamer, I don't look at this as just an inductive stimulus. I look at this as something that re-triggers this central nervous system, our innate system, to remember its balance, its essence. And in that, we can take that, and it's up to each and individual person when they get off that mat or stop that therapy, what they choose to do in their life, and how to maintain that feeling of optimal function. Well, and, and I think you hit the nail on the head, and that's one of the things that we really focus on here is there is no silver bullet, right? Cool. Um, Dr. Burke, I thank you so much for your time. This is a thank lot you, of folks. information, and I think our listeners will just eat this up. This is so fascinating. So tell us a little bit about who you are and uh, you know your whole journey to being the badass that you are. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, I, I do hold a Guinness World Book record for the fastest, and actually right now it's human on a bicycle. So I did beat the male record with my speed at 183.9 miles an hour on a bicycle. Um, and it was accomplished in September of 2018 at the Bonneville Salt Flats. And I did that drafting a race car. So I stayed in that pocket of air. It was still me on a bicycle, not connected to the vehicle, but utilizing that pocket of air called a draft or a slipstream. Uh, behind the vehicle while it increased speed I had to stay in that pocket and the last mile of that five mile course is 183.9 miles an hour is an average <laughs> for that last entire mile yeah I tell people that, yeah I did my last mile in 19 seconds <laughs> they're like what <laughs> you know I don't want to sound like Zach Efron when I say this but wow oh my god <laughs> If, if you've seen that new show on Netflix, I, I swear, like, if, if we turned that into a drinking oh, game, yeah. every time he said, wow, we kill people. Um, but that's amazing. A hundred, so you did a mile in 19 seconds. Yes. Um, there's, there's obviously not a lot of people who even want to go 180, you know, seven miles an hour on a bicycle. So why? Like, like that's, that's, I guess that's the first question is why do that? Well, I was very blessed. Um, I raced bicycles when I was a teenager and I had wonderful coaches and mentors, one of which is John Howard. And he actually is one of the very few men even because this is this record's gone started in 1899 by a man and had been always successfully broken by another man and my coach was the 1985 record holder and he went 152 miles an hour and so when i was a junior from the 87 to 91 in racing he was one of my wonderful mentors and nothing like this came up at that time but then i quit racing and did the whole career and family thing. I have three wonderful uh, boys um, that are actually now 26, 25, and 20, and um, have a family business. So I just sort of did that norm and then um, started decided, getting a little restless, I guess, athletically, and uh, got back into running. 
and then reconnected with my coach and he got me back on the bike and he saw there was something still there that I didn't see. I just thought, you know, I'm some mom and CEO that's out there trying to stay fit. And uh, he was the one who brought the idea up. And, he, and the way he brought it up was the fact that no woman in history has ever even attempted this record that men have held since 1899. And for me, I'm an adrenaline junkie. I was a downhill mountain bike racer when I was a junior. So a little bit of the crazy in me. And uh, this, I mean, literally, it couldn't have been a half a second of him saying that. I was like, I'm in. Because, I mean, I didn't care. Whatever speed I went, I get the first ever women's record. Well, a lot of times things don't always, the goals don't always stop where you think they are. And I, we actually went out there in 2016 and I went 147 miles an hour, very respectable speed. I got the women's record. I got in Guinness World Book records with that as the fastest female in the world. But I knew I could do more. And the very last day of the competition, it rained. And so we couldn't finish, you know, and really try for more because it was a four day event that we were at. And I, without even asking my race car driver, my coach, anybody, I said, I'm coming back next year and I'm going to beat the overall record. So I just threw down the gauntlet. It took two more years because of all lots of different challenges along the way, but it took two more years and I was able to do it. So it's just, you know, tenacity and, and staying focused on the dream. But it was really an idea that spawned from my coach and his ability to believe in me. Congratulations. That's amazing. Yeah, that's Thank you. Cool. So I've, I've never heard of this sport before. I would love to know what, like, because you said this is a four day event. I would love to know what that looks like. Are there people everywhere? Are people yeah. just like, wrenches are flying and tires are rolling down. <laughs> yeah, like, what, does this, yeah. what does this look like? I'm so curious. Well, the irony is we were in a very odd entry into a car and motorcycle speed event. It's, it's basically the clock against that, ve that vehicle against the clock. And they're trying to set records in all sorts of different categories. So there's motorcycles out there and there's all sorts of different types of vehicles, all the way from look up pickup truck looking vehicles, all the way to rail dragsters that are converted. Um, we're sort of like, hey, can we enter your event? Because you already got the timing and everything else as a cyclist following a vehicle, which was very different for them, but they were very open to that. So the event is called World of Speed, and it's out at Bonneville, the uh, Salt, uh, Bonneville Salt Flats, and um, we're that odd entry with a bicycle. So, um, But it is a, you know, everyone gets into... They have the pits area where everyone has their vehicles and they're wrenching on them. And then you have the start line and you get in line just like you're at Disneyland <laughs> waiting yeah. for your fun ride. <laughs> get in line. And once it's your turn, they do all the timing. They get it all set up and you go for your time. And it's a five mile course is the long course that I was on. And then you come around and you get your timing slip. They verify the course is clear and the next vehicle goes off. Um, so it, it's, it, and then you get back to the pits and it's, it's really cool. It's like an NASCAR pits, I guess you could say, but they're all inside. Everybody's working on their vehicles and, and I things like that. Say, this actually reminds me of something that I did recently. I'm sure you've heard of off-road racing, trophy truck racing. Oh yeah. The Mint 400. I actually raced in the Mint 400. <sighs> Like awesome. When was it a year or two years ago? Yeah, I was the navigator for a friend of mine. We were in the the UTV class, but same same yep. sort of situation. You're kind of like in this desert area. There's pits, wrenches flying. It's a wild. Yeah. It's kind of like a hurry up and wait kind of situation because you're like yes. always rushing to get ready and then you wait and then you it's. But it's, yep. it's a fun <laughs> experience to be just all the way out there doing all the you know all the stuff. So that's that is yeah. so great. I can definitely relate a little bit. So Although then I'm not you know, self power. Well, so so <laughs> yeah. that's, that's the question that I have because, you know, like obviously having been on a mountain bike once or twice in my life, I got nowhere close to 184 miles an hour. It's, it's 184, right? Yeah. 184. So 183.9, but who's counting? <laughs> Actually, I did hit 188 in the actual last mile, but my average was 183.9. <laughs> wow. <sighs> well, we round up here. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. <laughs> um, so <laughs> How does it, how does that work? How do you get your bike up to that speed? Is it geared differently? You know, what, obviously you're in the draft, but there's still got to be a significant amount of leg power to, you know, get up and maintain that, uh, that speed. Yes. Um, leg power, balance, um, reactions. I mean, there's, it, it's a whole essence. 
Um, but the bicycle is set up, it's a longer wheelbase. It's about a seven foot long bicycle. So the tires are uh, 17 inches. So it gives me a lower center of gravity, the longer wheelbase for stability, but it is only one gear. You don't wanna be sitting there switching gears when you're going 100 and some odd miles an hour because mechanically something could happen. So you wanna eliminate that possibility. So it is a direct drive, like a fixie uh, bicycle. So when the, when the pedals are moving, the wheels are moving and vice versa. So there is no free wheel where you could just sit there and like not pedal, <laughs> you're moving. And uh, one gear, and it has to be geared to where I can be pushing that gear at 180 miles an hour. Actually, we geared it for 170 <laughs> and we ended up going faster, which was awesome than what we, what we were really aiming for. Um, so with that, there is no way you can start off at zero in the same gear, you're gonna be able to pedal at 180 miles an hour. And so with that, I do have to get towed at least to 110 miles an hour because that's the point in which my RPMs are around 67 RPMs. And it's slow and it takes quite a bit to be able to push it. And at that point in time, now I can push it on my own and stay in the draft. And now we just increase in speed the vehicle keeps going faster. The draft keeps getting better, you know, because as the wind comes around and I'm pushing that much harder to stay in that area. Because technically, if I were to put my brakes on, I could go out the back end of that draft, which would be dangerous at, at high speeds. But, the, you know, so I have to do the work to stay in there. And the faster you go, the more violent the wind is shoving you from left to right. And that was something that I ended up having to deal with that was very different at this speed than it was at my 147 record or any of the other runs that I had done. I mean, the faster you go, the more violent you're getting pushed around in there. And that's where like a downhill mountain bike racer, you've got to react and react so quickly to each and everything. And if you're not reacting quick enough, something's going to get you. So, so that does beg the question, what happens if you fall out of the draft? The fastest I ever exited the draft was about 130 miles an hour and that was back in like 2016 when we had we had a bunch of failed you know we just didn't complete our mission we didn't complete the whole five miles in with each other and she Shea Holbrook my race car driver uh, was increasing in speed a little faster than I was able to stay in it and so we separated and uh, so 130 is, is, is about the limit that I felt was capable of getting out there and not being violently thrown off the bike. Um, but yes, if you were to get pushed out of the draft, you have to remember the draft is pushing me from behind when I'm inside the pocket. And the second you get out of the pocket, the wind's now in the front. So the switch of the wind coming from pushing you to in your face is sort of like a birthing. <laughs> and you get it going too violently and it's going to, it's like someone slapping you right off your bike. So I, I would have, I would feel like I could probably get out of there safely again, a little bit more than 130, but not much more. Yeah. And you had any accidents? That was my question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> not at that speed. Um, I've done a lot of training. My coach, John Howard, I, I failed to mention his name, but you know, I honor him with so much of, of why this has happened. But um, we did a lot of training and I never, would I've never fallen at speed or while in a drafting situation behind a vehicle because I would do uh, motorcycle drafting prior to this is some of my training, but I did have a very bad accident. My worst accident ever, which was in February of 2017, broke my shoulder blade stitches above the eye, you know, abrasion on the eye, the cheek and broke a broke a rib. And I went down in a training group ride at about 35 miles an hour. Yikes. So, yeah. go ahead. I know you had a question. Um, I'm curious about your training for this. Like, what is, how do you prepare for this? What does your physical training look like? And I guess also mental, because this is quite a mental, uh, a mental training too, isn't it? <laughs> Definitely. And I'm glad you asked because absolutely the physical training um, we did uh, weight workouts. We would do group rides. Uh, I would do individual time trial workouts. I would do uh, drafting behind the vehicle. So the training element would be like any top athlete. You're going to have a, a, a training program. I couldn't replicate doing the event because there was no place to be able to do that. My training had to be in the gym and to emulate as much as possible the way the muscles would work. So that's the physical side. 
And then you have the mental, because a lot of people don't think about that. And if you allow fear, especially at speeds like this, to get into your mind, it literally is where your thoughts are going to be and it overtakes them. And guess what? Usually you bring about what you think about. And so you don't want to think about that. So I had gone through, I had done um, hypnotherapy at the very beginning when I got back into bike racing because I was having problems with some of the one-to-one -one competition with other people. Um, and so I dealt with hypnotherapy. I also did this training for uh, my mind and neurofeedback style training. It's called train your brain. And I had all these little diodes connected to my head and this 45 minute session. And so it was helping with the brain and calming and being able to have positive reinforcement. I had a CD, a friend of mine put together to where right as I would go to sleep, I'd hit the play button, put the pods in my ear and the, the theta waves in that first little section, when you're starting to fall asleep, it was reinforcements of literally positive messages about being able to accomplish my record. And so it was very customized to me. And then of course you have all the other elements, your massage. And then something that I'm sure we'll talk more about is the Beamer. And that was something that really helped with my circulation, my recovery. And it's that little, all those little extra fine tunings that allow your body to unlock its maximum potential. So there was a lot that went in and, and I'd say just as much mental um, and, and all those other elements besides the physical to prepare for this. I was just thinking, have you ever done 184 miles an hour in a car? No. Okay. <laughs> like you and, did and definitely not in the mid 400 because you're going off rocks and stuff. Right. Yeah. It's a lot slower there too, but no, I have not ever okay. done that fast. So I've done probably like 120 in a car in Germany. And that gets scary. And you're in a car. So now I'm like, I'm, I'm picturing like, you know, just the fear that seems like it would creep up when you're doing 180 miles an hour on a bike. Because you probably have zero margin for error, right? Like, you know, anything yeah. goes wrong and they kind of pick you up with a sponge. Pretty much. Um, but here's another interesting element. And this is my own theory is I think there's a lot, the, a lot, the thing adrenaline junkie out there really helps describe people that have their elements of ADHD. Um, because for me, and this is my experience and why I, why I think like that is the faster I would go on the bicycle, the more I couldn't think of anything else. And I was in this very beautiful hyper-focused state. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I try and give an example. I've not been in this, but you hear people talk about, oh my gosh, I was in this car crash. And all of a sudden, everything started going in slow motion. Well, that slow motion is the hyper-focus. You are 100% in that moment to where it seems like slow motion. You actually, your time expands, as odd as that seems. So the faster I would go, the more it seemed like I could see every little tiny thing and had time for everything that was going on, even though that's counterintuitive to think about, but it was also this beautiful space because it's not often in my life that I could be there 100% in that moment. It's called the zone. You know, you, athletes call, call it zone. There's so many different ways to describe it. So yeah, when your life's on the line, you can't be thinking about what you're making for dinner. <laughs> and would you say that what you just said was attributed to the mental workouts you did or do you think that was a function of just the sport itself forcing you to kind of be completely present i would say it's a combination of everything it's very hard to when you, you try to slice out one little element over the other it is literally the recipe of all of these things that we did to put it together cool love it so yeah. you did bring up uh, you did bring up Beamer and the PEMF. Yeah. Uh, so love to ch chat with you a little bit about that and just kind of understand how did you incorporate that into your training and how did you even think to you know here's this you know electromagnetic frequency thing you know how does how does that you know get into a training regimen for someone who's trying to go you know 184 miles an hour. Well, the interesting thing is that the the people around you in your life are the ones that usually see what are those needs and what are the things that they can do to help? And um, I would like to say I sought out all sorts of things. I sought out the uh, being able to do the hypnotherapy. That was one thing I sought out 
But then I connected to another person who helped me with yet another device that was this like, not, not a hyperbaric chamber, but this, this altitude conditioning chamber that I used. And I love that. Well, the same person was in that in line and in, in dealing with Beamer, which is Ian Robb. And so he's the one who said, Hey, let's try this. And, you know, every time somebody would come into my life, they'd bring another element. Um, and you'd see the benefit of that element, but it's also, like I said, it's that little extra tweak here and there. And for me, um, the Beamer is just a life benefiting thing. I use it for obviously that extra little tweak to become the top end athlete, but I also use it on my, on a daily basis for just general overall health. 